Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the UVic Retirees Association and the Institute on Aging and Life Lifelong Health, I want to welcome you to the 2023 Masterminds Lecture Series. I respectfully acknowledge Lekwun peoples on whose territorial, traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimo, and Wasonga peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. My name is Margaret Klatt and I'm president of the UVic Retirees Association. Our association, also known as UVRA, maintains and works to strengthen the relationship between the University of Victoria and its retirees. With over 700 members, we are one of the largest associations of its kind in British Columbia. The Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health, a research center conducts and supports research in health services, population, digital health, brain health and behaviors and interventions to improve the health, aging and quality of life for peoples across the life's journey. This is the 17th annual manual Masterminds Lecture Series. The series began in 2006, spearheaded by UVRA board member and past Dean of Education, Dr. Beverly Timmons, and then director of what was known as the Center of Aging, Dr. Elaine Gallagher. Since then, we have produced the series every year, except for 2020, due to the sudden onset of COVID-19 restrictions. We will begin shortly with Dr. P uh, Patty Jean, better known as PJ Naylor's presentation, followed by a question and answer period. If you would like to ask PJ questions during a presentation, please type them in the Q&A box by clicking on the icon on your Zoom screen. Questions will be moderated and we will bring forward as many as possible during the question period. To confirm as audience members, your audio is muted and the camera is off. Note, you can adjust the view of your screen by clicking on the speaker's window and moving it as needed so it's not covering your slide view. You can add A1 word to text closed captioning to your screen by clicking on the closed captions icon. The event is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube and uploaded to the websites of UVRA and the Institute of Aging and Lifelong Health. Audio member, audience members will not appear on the recording. And now, I am delighted to introduce Dr. PJ Naylor. Dr. Naylor is an emeritus professor in the School of Exercise, Science, Physical and Health Education at the University of Victoria. Dr. Naylor's research focuses on children's physical activity, physical literacy and healthy eating, focusing on the settings where children live, learn and play. She has also been a co-investigator, evaluating the implementation of Choose to Move, a physical activity, act, uh, physical activity intervention for older adults. And her presentation is entitled, Physical Literacy Powered by Environment. I am now very pleased to turn over the microphone to you, PJ. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks everybody for coming. I was going after this beautiful couple of spring days. I'm I was expecting a few people to be in the garden. So it's wonderful that you made it. And especially since we've been living through a fairly cold spring. So I'm just waiting until, um, here we are. Here we are. So I'm gonna talk to you today about physical literacy and the importance of the environment to power it. And what I'm gonna do is introduce, um, next slide please. Sorry, yeah. Um, thought we'd do a little bit of an icebreaker uh, and then talk about what some of the problems are, the issues we're worrying about, and then define and describe what is physical activity and physical literacy and why they are important in life. And then I'm going to switch gears and start to talk about environment and what do we mean by environment and present a bit of research on the environment and then uh, one concept called affordances or invitations to move. And I will point out a few areas all along the way where environment is implicated in what I'm talking about. Next slide. So in the chat, I was hoping some of you wouldn't mind getting in there and telling us what interests you to about today's talk. 
Why are you here? Grandchildren, yourself, you've never heard of physical literacy, anything we'd like to hear why you're here and hopefully I can uh, hit your needs. Do people have access to the chat? They should have access to the chat. Okay. It's down below. If you go down where your uh, your bar is, it should be in the middle. But if it doesn't work, that's okay as well. Okay. Why don't we let that go? And we will. I'll I'll let you know what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about we're mostly retirees and in older, getting to be older adults. And I thought there's two things: the personal and the family life and grandchildren and children and things like that. So as you heard, I mostly spent most of my research working in the settings where children and youth are spending their time. And a lot of my research I'm gonna present is about that, but I've tried to make it more relevant by um, adding what I know about older adults and then hopefully pointing you in the direction when we can take what we've learned with children and take it over to the older adult lane. Okay, great, next slide, please. So you probably observed with the naked eye that we've radically changed our life and it's showing up on our bodies and it's showing up in our health behavior. We've moved from active commuting, active chores, active sports and active free time to passive commuting, passive chores, electronically assisted, uh, organized sport and a highly tempting recreational screen time in our free time. Next slide. And it is having an impact on the children in our country. So here you see that about 37% uh, of children are meeting the sweat component of the 24 hour movement guideline, doing about 60 minutes of moderate vigorous every day. So 60% aren't getting enough moderate vigorous physical activity. You can see about three quarters of them are meeting uh, screen time guidelines as in childhood, three quarters the sleep guideline, and again, only less than half are getting 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity during the school day. And after the pandemic, the number of children that were active enough was down and the number that were sedentary, sedentary pastimes has gone up. But there is one age group, and this gets us back to the argument about what the power of the environment is. Zero to four-year-olds in childcare, there's a study in Alberta where they actually showed their physical activity increased. And this is because during COVID, childcare was operating and they changed their model to provide lots of outdoor time where ventilation was greater. And we know, and I'll talk to you later about that, the more outdoor time, the bigger the space children are in, the more active they are. So it's just one hint about the power of the environment for influencing our, our health behavior. Next slide. And not just through COVID, but through that terrible situation of we've radically changed our life, we have about only 57% of adults in Canada that meet the 150 minutes of moderate vigorous physical activity a week. Now, what's interesting is during the true lockdowns, this went down, but it bounced back. And this is exactly the same as it was between about 2018 and 2020. Um, so next slide. But the one of the groups that is very impacted by the changes in our lifestyle, as well as the aging process, and came out of COVID uh, with less physical activity or older adults. And you can see less than 50% of older, older adults are meeting 150 minutes of moderate vigorous physical activity. Next slide. And uh, here's a colleagues of mine at Sport for Life called this inactive aging in that as Canadians age, they're progressively less likely to participate regularly in sport. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but it just illustrates what's going on as we age. And the level of participation in sport at all ages has also declined over the past decade. Next. And there is some research, I'm not an aging researcher, but there is some research about why 
don't older adults participate? And some of the research is on self-reported factors, such things as chronic conditions like osteoarthritis, time, lack of motivation, which is typical across all adults, pain and fatigue, lack of knowledge, fear of falling, and then financial barriers like fees, transportation, logistical things. So these are some of the self-reported factors. And we do know that when we look at exercisers, the, the exercises that are exercising will say that time is a barrier and exercise and people that aren't exercising will also say time isn't a barrier. And in these self-report studies, these authors, Smith and Ever all really looked at it and said, sometimes some people will say it's not a barrier because they don't exercise. So they went in and looked, next slide, quantitatively to see what was operating. Oh yeah, I wanted to highlight also, sorry, that social isolation and connection is emerging, even in the physical activity world through our choose to move, that this is a, a major issue for getting adults out and participating. Next slide. So uh, Smith decided to look at uh, 60, or on average 62 year olds, about almost 5,000 of them that reported no health condition, saying I don't have a limitation uh, that's affecting my physical activity. And this is quantitative, not qualitative, which I just reported about. So you see males down the middle column and females on the, if you click the slide for me. Yeah, thank you. So for males, um, a very environmental reason, having something not available in the area where they lived was quite predictive of um, participating and lack of motion reduced the likelihood of motivation reduced the likelihood of participating. The next click. And in with females, it was different. Lack of time and lack of energy emerged as significant, significant odds ratios. So not only do we see that some of the things we talk about qualitatively as being a problem didn't come up quantitatively when they were looking at these things and that, um, and that it differs by who we're talking about, which is a really important thing to remember. Next click. And the number one barrier though, uh, as with the qualitative, was the presence of chronic health conditions, which we know starts to emerge as we age. Next slide. So we know we have a problem. We're not active enough. And, um, but what am I talking about when we're talking about physical activity? Physical activity is any movement using the body that requires energy, it increases our heart rate and it speeds our rate of breathing. And it can be, it includes active play, active transport, doing active skills. It can be your walk, a hike. So all of that is included as well as your exercise session as physical activity. I've introduced a new term called physical literacy, uh, next slide. And this is a term that's emerged over the last decade in Canada and internationally. And it is the motivation, confidence, physical competence or skills, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. It's seen as a precursor. It, it results from being physically active. But it's also a precursor to choosing to be active. It's a very holistic concept, taking concepts that were always out there like motivation, like emotion and enjoyment, like valuing and um, our self-belief about our abilities into account all in, in one concept. Next slide. And you see that was a, this is also applicable in our older years that we still have to talk about our physical competence skills and actually physical abilities, like stand up and go from your chair, your confidence in being able to move. And we saw that fear of falling was something. And then the motivation and the knowledge and valuing physical activity to take responsibility. Next slide. And uh, John Kearney and some physical literacy researchers around the world, John used to be at the University of Toronto, have got together and looked at a model for how this works. So if you look on the left side of the screen, this is the physical literacy co concept, confidence and motivation, social participation, which has been in the Australian definition of physical literacy, movement competence across land, air, water, ice and snow, and then positive affect or the good feelings, fun, happiness, and enjoyment. 
And so there's physical literacy there, but we see it changes across all phases and it plays out across all phases of the lifespan. And being physically literate leads to more physical activity through active transportation, exercise or occupational. Um, that leads to some positive, positive physiological adaptations to stress, improve fitness, social and psychological adaptations, and then physical health, mental health, and social health. So it becomes quite critical and a foundational element. When we don't feel confident to move, we're not going to be choosing to move. If we don't enjoy moving, we're not going to be choosing to move. So the concept does lead into some of our choices. Next slide. So with children, what are the skills we're talking about? We're talking about foundational mo movement skills, like non-locomotor, like balancing and stabilizing and knowing where our bodies move in space and create creative motion. Next slide. It also includes locomotor activities like hopping, jumping, leaping, right? running. And next, it also includes something called manipulative skills, or we also call this hand-eye coordination, foot-eye coordination, or um, object control. We're trying to control something like a ball. And so this is throwing, kitching, catching, kicking, striking, like a hockey stick or something like that. And these are really important skills. And if they don't, children don't have them, they can't choose uh, to continue to play. Now, the skills that older adults, we um, are somewhat the same but also will vary. They might switch to things like, first of all, we'll introduce some fitness measures like the strength to get out of a chair and then the balance to be able to walk with walking poles or a cane or an assistive device. And so there are other different skills. They're not foundational. They're not gonna grow from them. They're trying to maintain. Next slide. So the literacy model works like this. When we're talking about letters, it goes, we learn our letters, they form words, and then words are put together into sentences. In numeracy, it's numbers, operations, and then into equations. In physical literacy, it's taking those movement skills, and then they go into sequences and then games. That's in the developmental stages when we're younger. Next slide. In older adults, we start to see the same pattern. It's just the, you know, can they still run, jump, throw, balance? And then there are movement sequences that allow us to choose to do things like lawn bowling. And then we take them to task. Or it might even be that we're getting down on the knee pad in the garden to garden or doing our housework. Next slide. So uh, in the traditional sporting world and what we're talking about when kids develop, we used to say can't catch, won't play. Well, if you can run, you can take part in soccer, basketball, volleyball, track and field. If you can throw, you soccer, softball, bowling, baseball, things like that, swimming. Next slide. In the older years, if you can walk, you may be able to do Nordic pole walking, dancing, Zumba, pickleball, yard work, golf. If you can throw, it might be curling or bocce, darts, um, lawn bowling. And if you can balance, it's things like yoga or Tai Chi, cleaning, cooking, winter walks and gardening. So it becomes a different list of what you can do with your abilities, your skills or your competencies. Next slide. But physical literacy is a lifelong journey. Our bodies change, grow and age, and we need to adapt and learn new movement skills. So there are older adults that learn new sports and activities, may take up lawn bowling. There's a lot of fun ways to be physically active and social, um, but there's also things that have to be learned when people do have a chronic condition like knee osteoarthritis. Might have to learn how to do uh, move around differently. Might have to learn how to work with assist assistive devices. So there are transitions to different activities that require us to adjust and adapt. And we can move through life doing different recreational things or master sports or community programs. Next slide. So how does it really work? Well, in the developmental stages in childhood, we are born, we have these reflexes and reactions and get into rudimentary sort of motions that happen. You see kids kicking out. And then we get into fundamental movement skills. And these are things like I said, rolling a ball or an overhand throw. You see something here called the proficiency barrier. 
And when children don't develop the foundational skills well enough, they can't cross the proficiency barrier. So they get to choose all of these other activities. They have enhanced opportunities to be physically active and enhanced opportunities to build self-esteem and motivation because the world is their oyster. Well, this proficiency barrier still works for older adults in a different way in that we start to, as we lose some capabilities, we may have to find ways to get over that proficiency barrier to make choices. We might have to adjust and adapt. So I think it's a really neat concept and it shows how some of the skills and abilities really lead to our choices. Next slide. And even more, how does the movement skill relate to health-related fitness, physical fitness? And this is as we become efficient movers, we gain confidence and motivation and we start to seek out active opportunities. And when we seek out active opportunities, we get physical fitness, which breaks down into things like strength, which becomes important for older adults, endurance and agility. And when once we are fit and it doesn't bother us to move or walk the stairs or go climbing up Mount Work, things like that, we start to persist with our activity when we give us more, the more activity we do, the more often, the more efficient we become and it becomes a cycle. And that's how we get into uh, health related physical fitness, which is really important to our ongoing wellness. Next slide. Related to motor skills in the developmental lane, they actually have shown that when children have good foundational motor skills, that they have increased participation in physical activity and in sport and skill specific physical activity. And if they, if they don't have those skills, they have low perceptions of physical competence. And what's really interesting, it's the object control skills or the manipulation skills like catching, throwing, kicking, striking, which um, predict adolescent physical activity and moderate vigorous physical activity. And that's probably because a lot of the games and things we play require some version of manipulative skills. Now, don't get me wrong, 60% of people will likely be walking as their enjoyment, enjoyable physical activity. It's a very popular activity that doesn't require object control skills. But if people want to branch out and play team-like activities and uh, do some structured activity, object control skills are predictive. Next slide. So why are physical activity and physical literacy important? You signed up for the call, so I suspect you know this, but um, next slide. It's really about physical and mental well-being. We know that physical activity is incredible, incredible for the cardiovascular system. It affects our lipid profiles. It affects the flexibility of our vessels and therefore our blood pressure. It affects how our heart rate, um, it also affects our skeleton, especially early on, we build skeleton and then we fight not to lose it as we age. It affects our muscle strength. So things like back pain, the ability to move around the world, it increases our insulin sensitivity. So if uh, type two diabetes is a risk, we become better at processing our insulin. So physical activity is incredibly important to our physical health. But even more so, it's incredibly important to mental well-being and to our social connectedness. That is, sometimes we go for a walk, that's how we meet our neighbors. And we meet other people when we're out at the slow pitch tournament and or the lawn bowling and when we gather as groups. So it's fairly important. Next slide. Our physical activity outcomes as we age become things like flexibility, which affects whether we can reach for things. Balance, which means that we're not as, as at risk for falling. Our strength, again, not at risk for falling. We can catch ourselves and we have the strength to move around and do functional activities, getting up, bending over to clean, and then our aerobic endurance. So the physical activity outcomes as we age are quite important. They're, at all ages, these are the outcomes. Next slide. And when we're talking mental well-being, when we are able to move well, we have increased self-esteem, improved attention, improved sleep. It's, it reduces stress. We know it affects mild and moderate, mild, mild anxiety and mild to moderate depression. 
And then in childhood, for sure, it's increasing resiliency. And as an elder adult, same thing. It reduces anxiety, improves our social and emotional well-being, increases our confidence, and increased autonomy. And this sounds great for young children as they become more independent, independent. But what we want to do is maintain our autonomy as we age. So critically important to all of these things. Next slide. And even more so, we know that moving our body and having blood pumping and having the neurons work, our active body equals active brain. That when we're moving, more of our brain is being activated. There's blood, blood flow in the, uh, in the system. And as children develop, we know that it relates to executive functions like paying attention, being able to control, um, control their own behaviors. Next slide. So I'm a childhood researcher. So early childhood is this critical time. And when I'm talking about physical literacy, it's because it's crucial physical and social development take place. So it becomes really important to have the younger children out moving more every day and have lots of opportunities to move because that shapes their brain and consequently their ongoing behaviors. All sorts of neurons are firing. And if we don't use them, they start to pare down as we're adults. So all these interactions with the environment impact their later health, emotional, and social outcomes. So it's critically important. Next slide. So if talking about your grandchildren, having them out and boat and having a lot of experiences, uh, physical experiences is one aspect. And the early years are also this window of opportunity. And if you have been around young children lately, you'll know they are not accurate about their perceptions of what's going on. So they went, mom, mom, look, I'm so good at jumping, look. And they're not getting off the ground, but because they're trying it, they're very positive. Just in trying to do it, they are positive about it. This gives us this great time to embed all these fundamental movement skills before they start to go, oh my gosh, John does that better than me. Oh my gosh, Sally is really good at that. I don't feel confident. Oh, and then they start to discount. And discounting is a process where to preserve our self-esteem, we shrink the importance of some areas where we don't feel we're as good and build the importance of other areas where we are. We don't want children to discount. So we want lots of exposure to a variety of playful activities in the early years that build the foundation uh, that they will choose to be active from later on. Next slide. It's a little bit different. The goal in older adulthood is not always, although it can be that you want to gain some skills to do an activity, say lawn bowling or, or darts or whatever it is. But Really what we start to aim, and this is um, DeFree's uh, model of rectangularization of aging, we're trying to manage conditions that we have, maximize our physical literacy so that we try to maintain as much balance, as much ability to move, um, as many skills that we can keep as possible and maintain our fitness. And then with that, we have huge quality of life until the end of life. So maintaining, managing, and maximizing so that we're resilient and durable as we age is more the goal in old, older adulthood. It's not laying on foundational skills. It's trying to keep those skills active. Next slide. So I thought we might as well practice what we preach. This is actually something we do in an energy break in a classroom, but it's great for like waking us up after dinner. So if you don't mind standing, Nobody can see you, so this is great. We're going to do a brain break. And the first one is we are going to cross our hands over and out four times, four sets of two. You go right hand over, left hand over, right. Cross, cross brain activity, keep us thinking. So a little body control, non-locomotor skills. And then we're going to touch our elbow to the knee, elbow to the knee. You could be sitting to do this too. You don't have to lift your knee. You could be standing or sitting, crossing the body. And then we're going to go for the big, uh, most difficult one. We're going to cross our arms at the same time as we cross our legs and then take them out and change. So we go out, in, out, in. Now, if you're sitting, it's just the arms where you actually can do it with your legs in your chair, or you can do it standing. Good. 
So those are the types of activities we're doing. Um, and they're actually doing them in independent living centers, in the, in the, um, in classes and things, trying to maintain balance, trying to maintain mobility, trying to keep the brain engaged and uh, make it possible for people to keep moving. Next slide, please. So that's physical activity, physical literacy, why we think it's really important to address. And now my next part of the talk is really about how do we view and see the environment as powering physical literacy or supporting it by creating, adapting, or going to different environments. Next slide. So what is the environment? It's any specific type of place or context where you can be physically active or move more. And you see all sorts of different images here. On here, this is the Sport for Life model where we show body control on ground, water, ice and snow, and air. And then you see also it can be indoors or outdoors, and it can be across all those mediums. And so there's a lot of places where we have to be active. And as a matter of fact, one of the things we do have to do as we age is we have to remember, and if we've lived on the West Coast and we're on the island too much, Sometimes we forget about how you have to walk differently on ice, what it is like to operate in the snow, um, all those types of things. A little more dangerous, requiring more balance, requiring a change of where we situate our weight. So those are all things that are physical literacy, things we've learned over time. Next slide. So there's multiple settings and environments we spend our time in. Preschools, schools, work sites, playgrounds, fields, and parks, in our home, in our independent living center, recreation and sport facilities. Those are all areas in the community. So we're not only at the individual level surrounded by family and friends, we take part in organizations and out in the community. Next. And in all those settings, there are actually multiple actors that are part of the environment and act on it and influence us. So those are people like teachers or care providers, group leaders, administrators in organizations, our family or our peers. So all those people act on us and influence what we do. Next slide. But what I'm really interested in, and I was introduced to this by a colleague, Dr. Viv Temple, uh, years ago in one of our projects, and it sounds like a fancy word, affordances, and I think, wow, that's a pretty fancy word for describing, you know, things that help or influence, but I've come to love it but mostly because the definition of it, it's an invitation for human action. So when I'm working with kids and I'm working with parents and teachers, I'm talking about an invitation to play, right? And with us and older adults and adults, we're talking an invitation to move. We have an invitation. Now Gibson's theory of affordance, which is from the 1970s, talks, of, talks about the environment uh, inviting physical activity. It could invite development of competencies. It could invite motivation, enjoyment, and confidence. So the environment can afford all these things. But we have to remember that affordances are perceived. So the affordance or the invitation is in the eye of the beholder. So it's like if you've ever seen on the school ground, there's a small children's playground on one side uh, like monkey bars, and there's a lar larger children's, the older children's playground on the other, and they are different heights. So if a small child goes over to the older children's playground, it doesn't invite them to play because they can't reach the first bar to climb. Whereas if they're on theirs, they can reach and then, oh, okay, I'm being invited to climb. This is cool, right? So it is perceived just as uh, a teenager might perceive something as inviting them and an older adult will think, it's absolutely not an invitation. And then it's also relational, that the environment interacts with who we are as people, our own self-confidence, we know about our own beliefs and abilities, and then the context we're in. So we could be in a context where there were more people our age, and they're trying a new activity like line dancing, and we'll do it, even though we're not that confident. Whereas if we're, or it's a lot of people we know, we are less likely to do it depending on if we're shy. So the context matters. And so the environment, the context, and the person all interact and result in human action. And the human action we want is to be moving more. Next slide. So this is uh, one of my videos I took. This is in Paris, believe it or not. 
And this is what I'd almost call a vertical playground. It's like a little climbing wall. This is on the wall of the path along the Seine. 7 a.m. in the morning, the boy and his dad cycled by on the path. So that really invited him to be active and to explore, to try it out. And then you see here, feeling a little bit unconfident and calling back to his dad. His dad only stands and waits to see, figures it out. And then a little bit of an assist, which I it was important. So he sees how far he has to stretch to the next. This is a very tempting play playground. Now I asked permission to film them and uh, the dad said yes, but the boy discovers me filming here. You can see it throws him off. So. Thanks, next slide. So, oh, there. So that was at seven in the morning. Was this a good invitation to play? I think so. Here is what's happening when I went by. I cycled by for my exercise in the morning and walked by with my friends in the afternoon. And this is the same area. Look at all the, all the, first of all, you see an affordance here for movement called a beautiful cycle trail. And Paris has become very cycling friendly and walking trail, and then they're dropping their bikes, they have scooters, and they all are getting tempted in by the invitation to play. And now they're experiencing climbing and balancing. Next slide. These are colleagues of mine in Denmark, uh, Jesper, and he's a physical activity researcher. And this was, they, they uh, mobilized, changed the environment on four, high school playgrounds to encourage physical activity. And so I increase in physical activity. And look, they have some risky play opportunities. They built hills so children could run down. There were embedded trampolines in some of these areas. There were markings because we know playground markings temp movement. They even, uh, for the girls underneath the covered area there, there's a large TV and they had, uh, movement oriented video games, Dance Dance Revolution was in this particular playground. So they built hills, they beat steel hills, they've um, built places to jump off of. Anyways, so this increased physical activity. Next slide. Now this is what's been going on in the Victoria area. Before all this happened, I had done a survey of all the, all the equipment to promote fundamental movement skills in four school districts, one in Richmond and three, um, Souk, Saanich and Victoria. And they were mostly flat and had nature scapes only just as border trees. And this happened after that. And this is a Lutz part and natural play space. And almost all the playgrounds have them. They dug some holes, they have loose natural elements and it just tempts a different type of child into it. They also now have a outdoor garden and classroom. You'll see a lot of those on the screen school districts now. Next. Now this is Central Middle School. Many of you may have been around. It is the flattest most old school playground for years. And they had this great health promotion initiative. They built some gardens and they got some money from Island Health, health promotion money. And they naturalized, started to naturalize their playground. And the first thing they did was build a hill and then they built an area for sitting in a rocky loggy area. So we were lucky and got ex, um, did some observations of physical activity during the recess and lunch times before and after the naturalization project. And although we didn't see increased moderate vigorous physical activity in all zones, in this particular zone, we saw an increase in moderate vigorous physical activity of the boys. And I'm sure the principal looked out the window and thought, holy doodle, what's going on here? But what the boys were doing to get increased moderate vigorous physical activity is their risky play, which is um, going at speed, uh, 
is one risk that you can take. They're running as fast as they could down the slope and leaping at the monkey bars and swinging off of them. And so that particular area increased boys' moderate vigorous physical activity through risky play. Next slide. So there's a substantive body of evidence that suggests the environment influences physical activity levels. This is the evidence of our eyes. Here's the typical North American big city. We don't have a lot of this in Victoria, but the exchanges and a car-orientated environment. And this is Europe. I believe this is probably Amsterdam, but it could be uh, Copenhagen and Denmark, which I think between the two of them, they're the top one and two cycling. In those places, first of all, there's huge invitation to cycle. And there is also uh, two bikes for every car because the invitation to cycle is so effective. And the invitation is not only their physical infrastructure, but you see it's social there. If you've been there, you know, everybody's doing it and you probably did it when you visited as well. Next slide. Um, yeah, and here we have what happens really, we have a very ambiguous society telling us to exercise, but putting very um, tempting sedentary options in our way. Next slide. So. What do we know about the environment influencing physical activity of levels of children? We know that if children are outside, they get more moderate vigorous physical activity. And in fact, if you just schedule more outside time during preschool and you have a bigger size of space, you get more physical activity. We know that urban park modifications invite physical activity and uh, markings plus new structures on school grounds invite more physical activity. Markings and loose equipment. So making sure there is that. And I talked to one principal at a, when we were doing a study in Victoria with, um, with seniors, old, older adults and adolescents and doing physical activity leadership in the elementary. I was talking to the principal and uh, equipment's so expensive now and the kids lose it and it takes about an hour to go around the playground collecting it. So now it's on a sign out only basis. But really if we put markings out, especially if they're novel and loose equipment, there's more MVPA, moderate vigorous physical activity. And then they are starting to see some recyclable and loose parts. It's more developmental. These are things like boxes and scarves and old tires and wood and things kids can build things with. So they haven't yet, it's just emerging on the physical activity end, not, not as uh, solid yet, but it really on the developmental end, very creative play going on. And then finally, there's a lot of naturalization and greening. And I just showed you um, what we found with the boys. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to change my slide myself. I apologize. So in childcare, which is an environment, the correlates of physical activity, there's some at the individual level. We know boys are more active than girls and boys have uh, more intense physical activity than girls in that setting. And that movement skills predicts uh, physical activity. But then at the environmental level, outdoors, they're more active, but this has some seasonality to it. Spaces and rules for play are important. In childcare, they're starting to, for risk management, starting to rule out anything where kicking, throwing, striking, or catching occurred. So we've had to build that back into the, into the ideas. Um, if they have greater than four field trips per year, in, increase in moderate vigorous physical activity, probably because they're walking to a park, they're walking to a destination, they're walking around a destination. And that policies and practices accounted for more than individual factors of the children, the individual differences in the children. So in childcare, we're, the environment does a lot. We call them the child care leader, health intermediary, because children don't choose. Next slide. Although I'm not a huge older adult researcher, I did go looking through my population health slides from when I was lecturing. And here's some things that actually show it also among older adults. That if older adults are in areas where there's good local shopping and services, um, there's good traffic and pedestrian infrastructure and neighborhood attractiveness and public transportation, that it influences the physical activity levels among older adults. And Rodriguez et al. looked at walking and found a systematic re residential density and the presence of retail uses are related to walking. And the higher the density, the greater land area devoted to retail, older adults walk more. 
and self-reported proximity to destinations and ease of walking to places were each related to walking. We even know this with kids walking to school. If they're within half a mile, they're likely to walk. And if they're outside that perimeter, they don't. But what's really good to know is if they take the bus, they walk more than somebody that is driven in the car because they have to walk to bus stops in a way. Next slide. So, but here's an, here's an example of what we might see that is not invitation. It's the opposite of an invitation to walk for an older adult with any kind of mobility issues. If they have mobility aids, look at all the different levels of pavement. Look at if you actually uh, had a walker, you might not fit in between the curb and or the sort of bullard thing and the telephone pole. This is the types of things where walking and in, there is no invitation to move here. It's the complete opposite of that. If people, the individual has some limitations or some balance issues. Next slide. I'm going to watch my time here. Um, there are some unbelievable invitations or accessibility initiatives. Like one of the things we know with older adults is they may want to have a break and take a rest in a walk. And if there's no place to sit, if there's no washrooms in parks, that's a number one deterrent for older adults using parks. So you see here in the middle of a walk, I think this is on the way to Home Depot, there's some benches and some nice benches at the corner and nice gathering areas and uh, washrooms and, and amenities that enhance the invitation, right? Next slide. A colleague of mine in Ontario did some of the first space research in the early years. There's also some in New South Wales that basically if the childcare scheduled more frequent outdoor play. So when kids go outside, they're most active, moderate, vigorous at the first 10 minutes when they're running around, just excited and having good. And then sometimes they'll settle into a sedentary activity. So the first 10 to 15 minutes is the most active time. So when you're increasing moderate, vigorous physical activity, instead of leaving them for long times where they start to um, some slow down, you actually can add another session and you get another little burst of moderate, vigorous physical activity. They also found that adding novel equipment, so the kids aren't bored and cruising the same equipment over and over. Uh, we have a great preschool story where um, the preschool leader out in their backyard got a pile of sand they were going to garden with, and they got six tiny shovels, and all she did was start to dig, right? And the kids are like, oh, what's going on over there? What's going on? And then they get the shovel, they dig. Well, did she have to tell them what to do the next time? No. So. Um, Novel equipment works. Next slide, please. We also know adult facilitation. That doesn't mean structuring like phys ed instructors. It's more like um, putting out some equipment, changing the environment, modeling the behavior, or prompting with positive comments to increase their participation or their trying. And we know with children this worked, and I suspect it will also work with us as adults in that if somebody's there helping us, talking about how we can do it, showing us, um, putting out the equipment that's better for us, say, if you're an older adult, you, you might have to modify a bowling game to be up at the knees, somebody doing that. So the invitation is more relevant. Um, that's facilitation. Next slide. So what do we have to think about really? We have to think about how do we create, alter, or go to different environments to power our physical literacy. And as older adults, we're trying to maintain our physical literacy, maintain our fitness. Children are trying to gain physical literacy. So what has the literature and the theory of affordance told us that we can do? Next slide. So number one is we need to think broadly about the environment. There is built structures and equipment uh, we can, it's not, but it's not just physical. So when we are thinking physical, is it indoor, outdoor? Do we have fixed equipment that people can use or loose? How big is the space? Because that encourages more physical activity. And what medium are we on? Is it ice, snow, air? Are we in the pool for uh, aqua size? And then, but thinking beyond the built environment and talking about the social structures and facilitation um, with children, is it, the parent, helps with the invitation. Siblings, with uh, adults and older adults, it might be friends and people in our community. 
Next slide. So invitations to play and move can be just setting up an environment that creates the motivation to be active. And I don't know if you've been at a rec center lately, but because we know playground markings and hallway markings in school affect children, you might have seen they have logs and a little balance line and places to hop and kids will try them out and start hopping. Um, so creating an invitation to be active, that might be in an older adult independent living center, putting out a fun, one of those games where you just toss it in the, the rope goes, I forget what you call it, rope goes around the target. It's like a version of bocce, but airborne. Um, set that up and people might take part in it or have ribbons out and, and be using them and then people start playing with them. And so there's modeling and verbal cues and prompting helps. So that's an external person in the environment. And structured activities, of course, we can lead games, we can put on music, marching and things, programmatic things. And then with older children and adults, it becomes really important that it's social and cooperative and creating enjoyment and engagement through social and peer involvement. So these are things we can think about uh, for ourselves, making sure, hey, that I've got a friend to do my walk with, that I help my friends by being positive, that we go to a program because we like music and company, uh, things like that. Next slide. In, um, in preschool, there's an early years group in Alberta called, uh, that developed the Apple model. And when they revised it, um, I was involved in that and wanted to say facilitation could look like a lot of things. So you see here, the environment provides an opportunity and exposure creates curiosity invites in and then we get playful or we get involved we explore it we might practice it becomes joyful because we get good at it and then there's some engagement if if children aren't engaging or adults aren't engaging by modeling active leadership participation with children oh children just love it the relation we have all sorts of early years providers who say when they start doing these playful activities that build fundamental movement skills that the relationship with the children increases because doing together is great. So I think this model, although it applies in childhood, I think it shows us. And then there's these relationships that child led or adult led individual choice matters to our motivation. It enhances the invitation and we can encourage and challenge people. And then within that, as we do that, we either maintain our physical literacy or with children they gain. So we provide an environment, they get in there and explore, we might help them get engaged and we develop relationships that support it. And so I like the model, have an apple every day, move more every day, be active, active play, those types of things. Next slide. Um, provide an environment so with children that invites children to play so number one, we schedule more time outside. So if you're looking after your grandkids and you want them to be more active, head out the door and where possible, if you can, into bigger spaces. Now, depending on how fast you can move, you have to be in a safer space. There's a couple of great parks where the roads are removed. There might be fencing. There's a path off roads and things like that. Uh, provide a wide range of play choices because remember the invitation is personal and individual. Children with different ages and abilities the invitation is different, okay? So we have to think about who's the child, what's going on. And then including creating novel invitations to play regularly with loose materials, going to nature, changing it up. And remembering that unstructured free, free play is super important. That sometimes adults actually, because they're so risk adverse, get involved and stop some of the things where children might build through risk, and I, I'm not talking danger, but through more risky, which is they're going faster, they're higher up and jumping, they might be using tools, or there may be a risk of getting lost. And when I'm talking early years, the risk of getting lost is in the back area of the childcare provider, there's some willows that create a tunnel. And some children will like to go in there and feel like they're hidden away. And that's a risky play at that age right? As they get older, it might be in the middle school that they get to go on a hike in the forest behind Royal Roy's University. Um, their parents drop them off at one end and pick them up at the other, you know, so it looks different. 
Next slide. For provide an environment that invites children and adolescents to play from the viewpoint of the child. Now we have to provide the opportunity to build confidence through risk and challenge. That's how it's done. What's interesting is they have one uh, stepping stone study that was done with children. And if you give them the ability to set the stepping stones uh, themselves, they'll choose the distance that they're confident they can do it at and then adjust them as they get more confident instead of having just, oh, here's the stepping stones we use at our childcare center or in our park. So allowing the child to choose the level of challenge they feel comfortable with. And then providing the opportunity for motor skill development through evolution so that they can do a harder and harder task. Next slide. So what does it look like inviting older adults? We really have to look at from the viewpoint of the older adult. And um, uh, my mom passed away last year and my dad, uh, I took my dad to some places where she wasn't able to go, but his balance is off because of a health condition. And I took him to a very rocky, uneven surface without thinking about it. And so we really have to remember to think from inside. So I learned my own lesson personally that way. I wasn't properly prepared to say, oh, we're going to have to walk down together, you know, and make sure that there, he didn't feel at risk and I didn't feel at risk. You know, we had it set up properly that nobody felt at risk. Um, provide the opportunity to build confidence to move. We provide adaptation and supports, assistive devices. Maybe the walk now has a walker or walking poles or a cane, or it's down the hall in an independent living where there's a railing. Um, that there is some rest stops and restroom access and that we consider those types of things. And uh, in older adults, safety and feeling comfortable in the neighborhood. And finally, with social connection, like programs that are in the province and available to you, like Choose to Move. That's more programmatic group exercise, uh, an evidence-based one, but those are the types of things um, that will help us invite older adults to move and maintain their fitness and maintain their health. And then providing the opportunity to main skills and skills and fitness. So let's not forget being playful and trying to tap a balloon, which children do to build their hand eye. We do, first of all, nobody doesn't laugh when they're tapping around a balloon. Second of all, it works on our balance and our hand eye and our ability to keep ourselves uh, moving. So yeah, we have to think about these things richly to invite people to move. Next slide. Oh, good. Okay, and I think I'm, I'm on time. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. If you haven't had a chance at this moment, we're now moving into the question and answer session. So if you haven't yet had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, please do that. Uh, and uh, click that icon down there, Q&A, and we'll try to get as many as we can. Great. Somebody did ask earlier at the beginning about mm -hmm. chronic pain intersecting with environmental considerations. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And I think if you think of physical literacy as a holistic concept that involves motivation and enjoyment and confidence. Chronic pain uh, is very, has some aspects of reducing enjoyment and reducing confidence in motion. And I, I think um, motivation. And so it is a very real thing as older adults start to have some afflictions or chronic issues. And if they do have that pain that we have to consider how that affects motivation. So it might be that we have to reach out to people with chronic pain. They might be isolated because their motivation is low. So it might be more, if we really want to invite them to move, it might have to be a very social invitation. As a matter of fact, in Choose to Move, uh, many of the adults in the research, it showed social connection was one of the key benefits of a group exercise program. So that might be one of the things. The other thing might be that uh, have, the individual has to work with their healthcare provider to talk about managing pain. Is it actually exacerbating? Are there things they can do to manage before and after being active? And, uh, and the other thing that'll happen with chronic pain is we start to limit our motions. If you've had a shoulder injury, you know, 
people can end up with frozen shoulder because the recovery is very painful. So we might not do our physical exercises and you end up with less range of motion, which is right into, as an older adult, the younger we're talking physical skills. And as an older adult, we're also talking physical abilities, like the strength, the ability to rotate our shoulder to reach back and get something when we're cleaning. So yes, I think it's a big issue. I don't think that they've answered it. They're just getting into the physical literacy and older adult space. They just wrote a consensus statement on it. But I think when you see the evidence from physical activity, which is what physical literacy has a component of physical activity and results in physical activity, it's a major barrier. Right. right. Very true. Yes. And the question here is, should the community pools, sports center fees be tax deductible? Would that help to invite seniors for participation? Tough word. Here's yeah, that. well, you know that there has been some research on the child tax credit. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, what happened is the more well-off, uh, well-to-do were had the resources to take advantage of the tax credit. So mm -hmm. the accessibility to the tax credit was hard because it was an afterwards. You, you pay your 400 for hockey and then you get your tax credit, which people that are at the lower income. They do have something called leisure involvement for everyone. So anybody can walk into a rec center and without having to prove their financial status, I think they get somewhere between six to 10 passes free. And that is working on that principle. You are right, reducing finances as a, as a barrier is important. I also know researchers that worked in a, a community in Surrey with older men. And one of the things they had to do, now this sounds different, but one of the literacies they had to learn was act is transportation systems because a lot of people aren't driving. So to get to all this infrastructure now, you have to feel confident to bus. You have to know how the system works now, how to get on, you know, in Vancouver, it'll be the SkyTrain, where the transfers are. And one of the things they did to move people more was get out and literally teach the skills of bus ridership, how to be safe, where their stops were. And so we start to expand our ideas of what we might need to make sure that an older adult is confident about. But yes, cost, cost for those that that's a barrier is important. And that's also why we want a lot of access very close to. So where the walking is safe and where there's park and things that people can walk to and shops where, they will go to shop on foot if it's close enough to them where they live and it's safe enough and they feel it's a good route to go. So it's important. Mm -hmm. I know proximity is one of the things that was mentioned in your slides is a very important thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, another question here is uh, I plan to pull out some chalk and add a hopscotch on the sidewalk outside our house. Yeah. Can you recommend <laughs> other chalk markings that might invite people to play a bit on their walk? Yes. Oh my gosh. The snake, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're doing the markings when they're buying them at the rec centers. They're doing logs so that people hop, hop or get the idea that they have to hop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, there's actually a book for elementary school, for elementary schools where there's about um, <clears throat> playground patterns. Oh. There's a million playground patterns. Now they now have these sticky things that go down the halls and mm -hmm. you can order them online. But the playground patterns, there's probably about four or five pages of different patterns. Some of them are spirals. Some of them are hopscotch, then the different kinds of hopscotch. And uh, yep, yep. Inviting people is a great idea. Fascinating, fascinating. We have some children next door that do the wonderful hopscotch on the streets. Marvelous to watch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do I have a couple other questions here? I'm looking to see. Ah, oh, I think that's, that's what we have at the moment. Yeah. But I think it's, it's interesting when you were you were talking about choosing to be active. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I know I'm taking this uh, aging backwards class. Yeah, and she's constantly talking about some of the things you've been doing. About, for example, this is for frozen shoulder. And yeah. but if your shoulder shoulder sore, don't move that much. Move this much. Yeah. Yeah. And, but keep doing it. Yes. Keep doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, although this wasn't about that, but it's really, really important. There are some people that message really well. Any movement is good movement and um, as much movement and light physical activity is important to maintaining 
as we get older. And light is like moving around the house, doing a bit of housework. And so you don't even have to say, I need to get on an exercise. If you're moving all the time and not sitting too much and it's light physical activity, it's doing a lot for you. So that starts to expand the definition of what is movement. We sort of have got this idea. I showed in the first slide that exercise is structured. We have to get out there and, you know, in reality, it's like walking along beside your spouse, your partner, your friend, and talking and moving. And same thing in the house. Some people like cleaning up their yard. That is, if you're out in your yard for an hour cleaning up, that's great physical activity. And it also maintains a lot of mobility. And so um, we do have to remember that any movement is good movement. And um, that, uh, yeah, we, we don't have to be setting idealistic ideas about it. But we do have to, and that's the invitation sometimes. Some people have to get the knowledge. Oh man, it doesn't have to be what I see on TV. It, and that's where working with groups of older adults or groups of children, when, when there's peer related models, it also helps, All right. So I always say, keep it social because if you don't feel like doing it, your, your friend does. If your friend doesn't feel like doing it, you do. And on the days that you both don't feel like doing it, there's a 50-50 chance you either go for coffee, which is good for you, or you actually cajole each other into doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> keep it social is my recommendation. <laughs> it's harder to say no to a friend. <laughs> your friend. Yeah. Okay. And then we have another question. Are short bursts of movement just as good as going for that one hour all at once? Yeah, well, so they actually, uh, you can accumulate physical activity across a day. So um, it's really just trying to acc accumulate the movement. And you can do it in short bursts and longer, a little bit here, a little longer there, a little bit here. You can add it up over the day. If you're hitting your 150 minutes, it doesn't matter how you do it. But what really does matter is it's your choice of how you like to do it. So they had a um, I used to sort of deal in the behavioral sciences. They had a researcher that um, was looking at choice. And if someone wants to do structured exercise and work fairly intensely for 30 minutes and you say, okay, just go do light physical activity throughout your day, snack on physical activity, they're going to be dissatisfied and not stick with it. But the person that likes, you know, just a very busy person, motivated, moving all the time, and you say, you can do that, and you can snack on physical activity and do just as much for yourself, they're more likely to adhere. So what I say is, remember, sticking with it is more important than uh, being perfect, and that choice is part of the invitation. Humans love to choose. We have autonomy. We love it. And so... Uh, I always say somebody will do exercise they don't like for up to two years, but after that, they don't keep going. So, I, I mean, it's probably shorter than that. I joke, but choose something you like. And and if you will be active um, in the yard, you set yourself up to do that. You know, and if if you break it up, little walk to the bus here, little take the stairs. You can get your cardiovascular very easily on the stairs wherever you are. Uh, yes, snack on it. Mm. Super. Yeah. We're just, Lee was just mentioning how marvelous that word snack on it. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting that you mentioned it. I know uh, my mother was a very active person and some people would say at your age, you shouldn't be doing so much. And it's interesting yeah. when you say what well, choice, it's part about choice. If you yeah. feel like doing it, yeah. where we just say it's the wrong activity. Well, and also we've changed our ideas about what aging we're trying to age rectangular, which yes. is we do have to keep mobility and keep our strength and that's a really critical part of aging. Well, I think in, in the UVic News today, there was a, a whole thing from the psychology department about aging well in the Reader's Digest, right? And oh. physical activity was a huge part of that. So if you get the UVic Digest, there's a little snippet this morning about it, about aging well and <laughs> physical activity is a piece of that because you just maintain, first of all, it's a mood enhancer. So mm -hmm. the depression and anxiety situation is off. And, um, but the second thing is we just maintain so much autonomy and ability to do more. It keeps us happy. Mm -hmm. I know I've been taking dance, I'm taking ballroom dancing and it's a uh, pretty big group. Oh yeah. Great for the brain too. Trying to remember the pattern. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. It can be music and joining that with physical activity. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. Marvelous. Good invitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How did you get involved though? What invited you in? Well, I 
it, it's simply because I thought if as you're getting older, what are these things you can do that will will make your an interesting and exciting and get social? Yeah. Dance is yeah. one where people like to get social. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yes. <laughs> good. Well, I think we're at the uh, I think I've got questions. Make sure I've got all our questions. And Leah put it put up the Reader's Digest article in the in excellent the chat. Thank you. So if anybody wants it, it's a good article. Yes, excellent. Wonderful. So thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. And we want to thank you very much for your presentation. It's been informative. It's been interesting. And uh, I think we've enjoyed it. I, I really have enjoyed hearing about the, the things you've been talking about and about the research that, you, that you've you brought forward about things to remember. I think that's really important.